So now we need to talk about diffusion and osmosis. So this is yet again one of our kind of biggies in biology, this idea of diffusion and then the special case of diffusion, which we call osmosis, the diffusion of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. This is going to be fundamental to all of life. So this idea that diffusion is the tendency of things to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And so this is inherent to the temperature of a system, right? So the temperature of a system is an average of the, um, the energy of the molecules in the system. And so all these mo molecules, regardless of whether I'm solid, liquid, or gas, they're moving. And as they move, things are bumped around. And so if I have another substance mixed in, into something, um, those, the molecular motion is going to tend to distribute that substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Right? So each molecule moves randomly, and, um, but ultimately we're going to see net movement to, uh, until we reach what's called equilibrium. And dynamic equilibrium means that all these molecules are moving around all the time. So the best way to look at this is with a picture. And the best way to think about it is if like you took a bucket of paint, like red paint, and dumped it into a swimming pool. Right? So if you did that, that red paint is going to be very, very red in the bucket, and it'll be red, red, red as it hits the water. But if you just sit there and wait, and wait a day or two, you're going to see that red paint diffuse throughout the entire pool. And then you'll basically have a pool that's light, light, light pink. Right? from that very deep end. Why? Because diffusion. Things moving towards equilibrium from areas of high concentration, where the paint is lots and lots of paint molecules, to areas of low concentration, where there's no paint molecules. So we see this here. And so in the top area, you see now we've got a membrane that's got holes in it, and those holes are big enough for this dye to move across, that ultimately we have a region of high concentration on the left that's going to move to a region of low concentration on the right, until we reach equilibrium. Now, equilibrium doesn't mean that these molecules are now um, not in motion. They are moving back and forth, but they're moving back and forth at the same rate that the concentrations are the same on both sides of that barrier. And you can also see that each individual species, meaning type of molecule, um, is going to move independent of others. So if I put a bunch of orange paint over here and a bunch of purple paint over here, we're not going to see any um, less diffusion of the orange paint because the purple paint's there. They're going to diffuse independent of each other. Right? So each is moving towards its own separate equilibrium. And that's going to be really, really important for all of the um, bioenergetics that we talk about as we get into metabolism. So these are foundational concepts. Right? So things want to move down their concentration gradient. Right? And this is how we talked about passive transport into the cell, where the cell can kind of hijack a system that has a higher concentration to the outside of the cell to move something into the cell without having to spend energy. Now, there's a very special case of diffusion that we need to talk about that every bit of life has to deal with, and that is osmosis. So because we know that life is water-based, so all most of the biochemistry that's occurring inside the cell is um, in an aqueous environment, right? So it's in water. Again, we look for water on other planets because if we find water, there's a chance that we can find life like our, like us, like that we're familiar with. But water has some issues based on diffusion. So it's not um, exempt from diffusion. So let's look at this situation here. So this is a classic example of um, what's called an osmotic pump. So here you've got a U-shaped tube. And the membrane that we're looking at here is very special. It has pores in it that are only big enough for water to move through. So the other solutes, in this case sugar, that are in the water on either side of the membrane cannot move through the membrane. So what we're going to see here now is, in essence, on the left side of the membrane is a, a higher concentration of water than the right side of the membrane. Because we have two equal volumes, if there's more sugar on the right side, Literally, there's more sugar than water than sugar on the left side. There's, there's less water. So things want to move down their concentration gradient from where they are to where they're not. And so the water wants to move to where it's not. And so literally, it'll start to move across the membrane and push that water column up the U-shaped tube. You can actually do work with this osmotic pump. 
right? And it's going to move over until it reaches equilibrium. Now it's about the concentration of sugar on either side. We have a greater volume on the right side than the left, but the concentration of sugar is now the same because we've diluted the sugar with the excess water moving across the membrane, and now we've reached equilibrium again. Osmosis, the movement of water from regions of high water concentration to regions of low water concentration. The other way to put this, and this is, you got to be really careful with this, this is water moving from regions of low solute concentration to regions of high solute concentration. This is why you salt meat to preserve it. This is why you make jerky. When you put a bunch of sugar and salt on meat, you suck the water out of it. And when it's dried out like that, things that try to grow on it die because the salt has a high concentration of solute. There's no water there, and it sucks the water out of cells that land on it and try to grow and rot it. All right? So osmosis is very important. Now, this introduces then a whole new set of terminology that we call um, tonicity. So this is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. So it's a relative term. So if you have an isotonic solution, it means that the solution outside of the cell has the same concentration of solutes as inside of the cell. And so your body, the internal environment, is isotonic. So all your fluids have to be the same concentration of solutes to the inside of your cells. Otherwise, your cells will get all jacked out of shape as water moves in or out of them. So water is going to move in or out of a cell if you have a hypertonic or hypotonic solution. So a hypertonic solution is when you have a solute concentration that is greater than inside the cell. So if this is, again, the, the, the example of, of beef jerky. Like you're adding a bunch of salt. You're creating a, a concentration of, of solute outside the cell. It's much, much higher. It draws the water out, right? Um, hypotonic is the opposite. Hypotonic is you have less salt on the outside of the cell, so water wants to go um, where it's not. So it's going to move into the cell, because the cell has a higher concentration of solutes, and the cell gains water, and that can be problematic. So let's look at the difference between animals and plant cells dealing with that problem. So in a hypotonic solution, if, if I put one of your cells in pure water, ultimately the water is going to move into the cell because the cytoplasm is richer in solutes, and the membrane can't expand fast enough. And ultimately, it's going to burst and lice and kill the cell. So pure water can wipe out your red blood cells. Now, if you're a plant cell, the cell wall kicks in. And this is great because now it's like trying to inflate a balloon within a box. You can only blow on the balloon so hard before the walls of the box push back and don't let you blow it up anymore. So water tries to get in, but it reaches equilibrium because the pressure that the walls exert on the cell don't allow that cell to expand any further. And that is called a turgid cell. It's rigid to a certain extent because of the pressure of the water inside. So hypotonic. Isotonic, again, you're going to see a normal cell if you're an animal cell, somewhat flaccid if you're a plant cell. And then a hypertonic solution is going to cause what the fancy word is crenelation, or you're going to shrivel that cell up if you're an animal cell. If you're a plant cell, it's going to become plasmalized. Right? So every organism has to have some means for what's called osmoregulation to control the water balance between its cytoplasm and its environment. So for example, a paramecium, a single-celled eukaryotic organism, has these special organelles called um, contractile vacuoles. Right? So again, if you don't know what to call it, you call it a vacuole. So these things actually collect excess water and then pump it out of the cell. Now, again, when it comes to plants, we want to go over those, fir those terms. Turgid means that your, it's a, the cell is firm, it's rigid, because it's in a hypotonic solution. Um, and it goes flaccid if it's in an isotonic solution. And finally, it's plasmalized if it has in a um, hypertonic environment where you're drawing water away from the cell. And that plasmolysis then results in, again, the rigidity of the cell wall is maintained, but the cytoplasm, the plasma membrane, pulls away from the cell walls, and you see this kind of like star-like form, or it may crumple up into a small bag kind of inside the empty box that was the cell wall.